uh, many of us make resolutions. It's a good time of year to start something new. We often talk about this around the time school, a school year starts, beginning of a new year. Those are good times to say, okay, let's, let's create some new patterns. Let's start some new things. Let's do some things differently. And why are they so very hard to keep? And I want to, I want to use as an illustration as we kick off why things are so hard to keep and maybe some adjustments you can make to a lot of resolutions. One example, and that's reading your Bible. Now, I will continue to challenge you over and over again to read your Bible, to read your Bible every day, and to take next steps in reading your Bible, because it has been proven uh, that whatever your, er whatever your level of spiritual growth, if you've been a Christian for a really long time, really leaning into it, or your spiritual seeker, there's nothing that impacts your spiritual growth more substantially than reading your Bible. And then finding next steps in reading your Bible. God's Word is powerful and it transforms and it changes and it makes us more like Jesus. And it's a big deal and we can't just step away from this. However, it can be a challenge. Now, I've challenged you for a long time to... And this is something I have done for 30-something years now. Read through the whole Bible in a year. And it's not that hard. It's just a few minutes a day to accomplish that goal. It's just you have to do it every day for 365 days. And then it's all done. But you know, like a lot of failed resolutions, uh, reading your Bible daily is one that falls by the wayside sometimes early on. Now, here's, here's some reasons why. And this is true for a lot of different resolutions we make. We start out too ambitiously. You say, you know, starting today, I'm going to read the Bible for 30 minutes, and I'm going to pray for 30 minutes, and I'm going to do that, and maybe on January the 1st, you, you are successful. But that may be too ambitious for a lot of folks. It's, it's like uh, going from zero to 100 on roller skates. It's, it's exciting for a moment, but it's not sustainable necessarily. You want to do something that's sustainable. If you're not, already in this, you're not already in this habit, that may be asking too much. It may be pushing you too hard. So instead, I just encourage you in your Bible reading, find something that is consistent and that is sustainable. Uh, I've challenged you in, earlier this year, maybe you just start and say, I'm going to read the Bible for five minutes. And once I have read the Bible for five minutes, just pick out one of those New Testament books, one of the Gospels, and just start reading for five minutes when you finish your, set a timer for yourself. When you finish your five minutes, then pray for two minutes about what you just read. Okay, uh, th there was an example to follow. There was a sin to avoid. There was a command to obey. There's something in what you read that you can apply to your life. And you pray about, talk to God about that. Helping you to do that. And then pray about anything else that comes to mind. Two minutes will go by pretty quick. Five and two and you're on your way. For others of you, you've been about this Christian life for a while, and you can take a bigger step than that. You can take a broader leap than that, but you have to start somewhere. And my experience is, once I begin a rhythm, and I get in a habit, and I start seeing the benefits of the habit, it gets easier to expand on the habit. Uh, this applies to a lot of different things. S some of you may go to the same gym that I go to here in town. It's one of my favorite illustrations. There were two guys at the gym yesterday. It was the last day of the year, and they were going to make up for not exercising for, since high school. <laughs> They're about my age, and they were going to make up the difference in a day. And they did a mega workout. We will never see them at the gym again, which is the great part for a guy like me who's a regular, that the crowd thins out pretty quick. Start too ambitiously, and you just blow out, burn out, fall by the wayside. Here's another thing, getting too far behind. And I would just say, say this to you in your Bible reading. Don't let guilt get the best of you. And it often does where you say, okay, it's uh, November and uh, I'm reading my daily Bible reading for February the 5th. I may have fallen behind. Well, don't, don't feel like, oh man, I'm such a failure. I might as well just quit. You're going to miss some days in all likelihood in the course of a day. Things are going to pop up at the time you're regularly reading your Bible. And it gets pushed to the side for that time, but that, that's not the end of the world. Uh, keep going. Don't give up. Hang in there. If you miss a day or two, it's not the end of the world. Don't give up. And if I haven't mentioned this earlier, I want to say it again. Don't give up. 
then sometimes in Bible reading, it's just reading the wrong time of the day. Uh, a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to do it first thing in the morning. I'm going to bounce out of, you don't bounce out of bed for anything, but you're going to bounce out of bed to read the Bible, or you're going to read the Bible just before you go to bed. And the magnetic attraction of sleep will sink your battleship both either direction. So how do you, how do you get better at reading your Bible daily? Well, you find a time that works for you. You find a, a method that works for you. You find a delivery system that works for you. And so if you're going to read your Bible daily, you, you find a time. And some of you, it's, okay, at lunch I can block some time. Uh, I, you have to beat traffic, so you're, you're traveling uh, across Metroplex. You, you get to where you are. A lot of times you get there early and you just sit in the parking lot and you listen to the radio or something. Well, you could read the Bible then. But if you don't schedule it, it's just not going to happen. For me, I schedule my appointments with God like I schedule any other appointment. I schedule mine early in my day, but it's not the first thing that I do because I just do a whole lot better if I wake up and I go to the gym. I do a lot of reading at the gym, but I don't read my Bible at the gym usually. Then I get, I get back, clean up, eat my breakfast, get to the office earlier, and everything's quiet. And that's when I do, because that, that's what works for me. You have to find what works for you. For, for a lot of you, you're commuting anyway. You're just going to be in a car for a while. Get, get onto you version, that Bible app, and let somebody else read it to you. You can set that thing up so that it will be, the Bible will be read to you on a daily basis. And just so you know, that's not cheating. Some of you just feel like you, you did something illegal by letting someone else read the Bible to you. It's okay. Let someone else read the Bible to you. Because you want to hear what God has to say. And you're on a commute. You can, you can uh, cover a lot of God's Word by uh, using that Bible app, encourage you in that direction. There are multiple Bible reading plans on our church website. Find the one that works for you. There are a lot of different approaches. Now, there are plenty of resolutions for you to choose from in a new year. Today, I want to offer you some spiritual resolutions to consider, not just uh, get out of debt, though later this month, we're going to focus in a big way, we're bringing back a dear friend of our church. Some of you are well familiar with him and most grateful for his ministry, as uh, is true for Rhonda and I. For others, it's, uh, it's a new guy. His name is Bruce Ammons. And Bruce is coming to our church at the end of this month for this Conquering Debt God's Way seminar. It's fantastic. It covers a lot of the same kind of principles you've seen in Financial Peace University, but it's in a one-day condensed version and man, it has been so liberating for so many of us. And you're going to be blessed. Getting out of debt's a good thing. Exercising, taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit, as the Bible talks about our bodies, that's a big deal. But I want to talk about some spiritual resolutions today. Now, Christians, we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves as a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. So the Bible uses, uses this act active imagery to talk about what it means to be a Christian. And we tend to dumb that down. Like, Christian means you prop your feet up and you sit back and you say, hey, I prayed a sinner's prayer and I was baptized at some point and I'm just waiting to go to heaven now and doing whatever I want to in between. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the doctrine of salvation in our church in 2017 because I think a lot of people have decided they're saved by saying the right words in a prayer and being baptized instead of having a life-changing commitment to Jesus Christ. And we don't want to play with eternity and where we're going to spend it. So we want to get this right. So we're going to focus on this. We're saved by grace through faith, but it's not a cheap grace. And it's not a faith that doesn't have substance behind it. So when the Bible talks about the Christian life, it uses words like a race, a fight, a pursuit, a war, training in godliness... And why shouldn't we strive for spiritual growth? Why shouldn't we lean into it? Why shouldn't we seek to, to grow and to serve and, and to love one another and to love people outside our walls with the with heart of Jesus? Because God gave His Son to die on the cross to pay for our sins that we could be set free from sin and death. And, and we ought to give Him everything. We ought to lean into this with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So... I want to talk about some resolutions today. We're going to do this from the book of Colossians. And we'll be walking through phrases and words this morning. So let's begin. We're going to look at Colossians chapter 3. This is just a great passage. 
Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. When you get into Thessalonians, you've overshot your target. So back it up a couple of pages to Colossians chapter 3. And this is verse 5. I'm going to read from the ESV version. Here's what it says. Paul says, To the people in a town called Colossae, a church of the Colossians, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. He gives more examples. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Jew, a Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then... As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must forgive. And above all, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Amen and amen. All right. Here are just a few biblical resolutions from Colossians 3 to help you think about, pray about this new year, and we're going to cover a lot of territory in a short amount of time. You want to write some of this down, there's a program outline. Make use of that. Keep it with you as you pray, God, what is this new year going to look like for me? Here's the first thing that I I pick up from Apostle Paul. We must put off certain things. In verse 8, Paul says to remove some things. So if you are in Christ, which is his favorite way of talking about having a relationship to God, that you know your sin is forgiven, you're walking in love relationship with Him, you're going to spend eternity with Him in heaven. If you are in Christ, Christ is your Savior, there's certain things you put off. And you put them off, he says, like a filthy garment, like, like dirty clothes. You, you get rid of them. You put them away. Verse 5 makes the application even clearer. When Christ is your life, not just your religion, and that's an important, important distinction, I think, for us, that Christ is not just, well, let's see, it's Sunday, so I'm going to go. I'll check my religion box. I did my religion thing, and I can put that away. No, when Christ, when Christ is your life, not just your religion, but your life, There are choices that you make, and there are spiritual funerals that need to take place in our lives. To put things to death is how Paul says it in verse 5. That means there's just a complete extermination of some things. Now, that is not our preferred method of doing this. Our preferred method is sin management. We We should offer degrees in sin management, some advanced degrees in sin management. Because instead of putting to death sin, it's putting away sin... We just manage our sin. We say, well, this is not that bad. This one I think I can control. I think that I can live comfortably with this sin. It's not really disrupting anything too badly, everything too badly. I'm I'm just going to manage this sin. No, he says, put it to death. Living the Christian life, the life that is set apart, the life that is transformed, the life that is all things new, born again, That's what a genuine follower of Christ should be living. That kind of life is is clearly discernible from somebody's life that doesn't know Jesus. Does that make sense? That if you belong to Jesus, your life is distinctly different than somebody who doesn't belong to Jesus. Now, that shouldn't be such a shock to us. 
But what we found through some national research is that people who say, I believe the Bible, Jesus is my Savior, I belong to Him, what their lost friends say about that person is, I can't tell any difference. They don't do life differently than me. They don't approach challenges of life differently than me. They, they don't look, talk, act, seem to believe differently than me. It should not be so. And this has to be more than a fish emblem on your car. It has to be more than a spiritual bumper sticker or a t-shirt. It's a difference in who you are in your character. And it's showing up in ways that are tangible, measurable, real. When you give your life to Christ, there's this process of becoming like Christ. We call that discipleship, right? Discipleship is I'm getting to be more like Jesus every day. And... Here's, here's how it's described in the book of Philippians. Paul wrote, continue to work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. You're already saved, but you're working to develop it with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So it's a cooperative effort. Spiritual growth is a cooperative effort. When you come to know Christ, the Holy Spirit resides in you and God's at work in you. But then there's some things that you work on too. I heard a guy say years and years ago that there's good news and bad news. Good news is that as a believer in Christ, Christ is at work in you. Uh, Bad news is you're still in you too. And that part is an anchor that, that we drag way too long. There are remnants of an old life that need to be systematically put aside. Now, what needs to go? Well, Paul, Paul starts like this. He starts with an outside perspective, then he moves to more internal motivations, internal drives that cause those actions. So here we go. He says, put aside sexual immorality. And he puts that up there high because in the world in which he lived in the first century, sex was everywhere and it sold everything just like it does today. There's so much in common with that first century world and our world. So he says, put aside sexual immorality. And That word sexual immorality, and we've spent some time talking about this uh, several months ago. It's it's a word from which we get our word pornography. The the Greek word porneia. So you hear the word in there, porneia, sexual immorality. And this is how it's defined in Scripture. You remember what Jesus said about uh, about sexual expression? He said in uh, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, it happens A man and a woman, married to one another, committed to one another for life under the authority of God. And you draw a circle around that picture, and that's where sexual expression happens. Anything outside that circle, that's porneia. That's sexual immorality. That's outside of God's plan. So, sexual immorality, a man and a woman, committed to one another for life under the authority of God. Anything outside of that? That's what they're calling impurity, sexual immorality. And and then he breaks it out more with words like lust, evil desires. Listen, Jesus didn't die on the cross for your sin that you would come to be enslaved by sexual immorality. At any level, in any area, you need to turn from sin. You need to call it sin. Now, this is not one of those places you just manage it because people don't know. You seek God's forgiveness. The Bible says flee sexual immorality. It's not, well, I think I can, how close to the edge of, of that definition can I get in any area? How close can I be and not step over the line? He says, you should just run the other way as fast as you can go. And it's going to clean up a lot of the things that become destructive in our sinful nature. And he talks about greed. Now he's moving more to the inside, the the motivation uh, motivation side of us. Uh, Greed, covetousness. It's just always wanting what you don't have. There's nothing with godly ambition, with seeking to get better, with seeking to improve, with seeking to do your best. Always, uh, please lean into that. But this is saying, I want what you have. I want what she has. I I, want to have a house like that. I want to have a job like that. I want to drive a car like that. I want more money. I want more stuff. I want want more. And it begins to eat away at us because it's a selfishness. And this is true for someone who is really, really wealthy and true for someone who is really, really poor. It, It can hit either side of that, everybody in between. Never satisfied and also willing to sin in order to get what you want. 
to, to go to immoral means to accomplish those goals. Paul says all these I wants in life amount to idolatry. It, it becomes your God. It becomes that thing that you worship because it has all of your attention, all of your devotion, all of your energy, all of your giftedness, all leaning in that direction. It takes the place of God, and that's what idolatry is. And stuff, material possessions, and material desire can do it in a hurry. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't have two gods in your life. And we ask, and so what is the focus of your worship today? And I'm not talking about because you're sitting in this building. I'm talking about your life, the focus of your life moving into 2017. Paul reminds his readers once again, that's the way you used to live. Don't do that anymore. You turn from that. You turn to God. You put your focus on Him. You change. You live differently than the rest of the world. And one of the reasons why is he says the wrath of God is out there. We talk about God's love, and God's love is an overwhelming characteristic of His person. But the wrath of God is also a characteristic of His person. That He hates sin, and He judges sin. And there are consequences for sin. And if you're a believer, he will discipline you because of sin. And if you're lost, ultimately the wrath of God comes for eternal things. For the person that does not know Christ. Judgment is sure. Verse 8, Paul jumped in some more things, more external. You need to put these things away. This is just a quick list. Anger. The word anger here, it's the slow smoldering beneath the surface, just eating away at you kind of anger. And some, some of us carry that for years for any number of reasons. He talks, about, he talks about rage, and that's the quick sudden burst of anger, the anger that boils over and explodes on other people. He moves on to the tongue, uh, slander, uh, filthy language, the words that we use. He talks about malice. Just wishing that bad things would happen to other people. And, and doing all you can to kind of fan the flame that it just might. He talks, about, he talks about slander, attacking the character of another person. With, with the object being that y you want to wreck their reputation. Lying. Uh, just not living the Christ-like life because Christ is the truth and uh, the truth not being valuable to you. Now note, most of this, this list just ran through relates to how we relate to other people. Because the Christian life is lived in the context of relationships. We, one of the things that American Christianity has done that really makes it stand apart from Christian expression in a lot of other parts of the world is that it's all wrapped around me and God. Me and Jesus. And there's always a me and Jesus side of this. A personal relationship to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. But the we in God makes up most of what the Bible talks about. It's not just me and God, but the we and God. It's like the uh, model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Is it? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. All plurals because the context for living the Christian life is the family of faith. It's the church. And when you discount the church from your relationship to God, you need to go back and check on the relationship to God part because you've made a choice that is far from God. So it's in the crucible of relationships. Now, keeping in mind the context, Paul is saying, if this old sinful nature is, is put off and is being put off, you're, 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 you're dumping that side of you. He says, don't be tempted at a critical moment to put that back on. Don't be tempted to turn back from that. And some of you could give a testimony about that, where you say, there's an area of my life, an area of my discipleship, an area of my fellowship with God, where I look back several Januaries ago, and I had that all squared away. And my relationship to God in that area of my life were, were spot on, moving in the right direction. But today, I really lost ground on that. I'm not, I'm not where I was. I... 
and I, and I didn't get better. I got worse. I, he says, don't, don't lose ground that you've taken, but continue to move forward. You choose. We're all making choices every day. And you choose your attitudes, your behaviors, your responses, your commitments, your influence on others. All right, things we put away. There are also some things we put on. We must put on certain things. And he says, put on the new self, the new, the new man. The metaphor is the same as in verse 9. You put on fresh new clothes. You put off your old filthy garments. You put on the fresh new clothes. And it's also a present tense as it describes this. It means that it's a continuing action. You don't just say, okay, I put on the new and now I'm all clear. I don't have to worry about that for the rest of the year. No, it's, a, it's an ongoing every day. You're making a choice of putting on that which honors Christ, that which reflects, reflects his character. The prodigal son story uh, illustrates that well. Remember the prodigal son? He has everything, and he blows through uh, a lot. And he hits rock bottom and decides, i got to come home. And he comes home to his father. He's, th- he's in rags. He, he's a part of a landowning family. Shoes on his feet. Everything is great. When he comes back, he's in tattered rags. No shoes. This, this is how a slave would conduct themselves in public places. But it says, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. The things you put on. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Here's the good news about putting on, putting on Christ. Uh, how many of you had an adventure this morning dressing a preschooler? You know, it's just, yeah, it's a treat. It's like trying to put spaghetti into something. It's just everywhere. And, and, and they need some help. And like a young child, we need some help putting on Christ to reflect Him. And there is, our, there is our Heavenly Father to do just that. The Holy Spirit in us as followers of Jesus Christ to help us accomplish the image of Christ. And here's also the other side of that is just like small children, we're not all that cooperative all the time, right? God's trying, God's working, God's pushing, God's reminding, God's empowering, and we're still pulling against it. Paul wrote, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, perfect will. A radical change has taken place in the believer's life. And there's this continuing renewal and a continuing need for spiritual growth, growth in grace and knowledge of Christ. And it's something that's going on all the time. And the believer needs to cooperate in this. So, okay, what do you put on? And this is a great list. Say, okay, out out of this list, where are the ones that are deficits for me? Where are the ones I need to grow in? Where are the ones that are just non-existent right now that I need to get a start in? So what do we put on? He says, put on a heart of compassion. Compassion means you just care about other people. In 2017, and I'll talk about this next week. We're going to do a big vision sweep next week. It's going to cover a lot of my heart for our church, for our community, for our city. But we want to grow in compassion. Compassion inside the walls, compassion outside the walls. We want to take a lot of our ministry outside the walls of here and to people who are just going to be far from God for a long time unless we go and find them. Because they may, it may be a long time before they come walking through the doors of here. So we want to grow in compassion. And God's people are to be a compassionate people who identify with the hurts of humanity. And then kindness is the next word. Kindness means always seeking the best for other people, always seeking their highest good. Kindness is compassion in action. You're doing something. In the Bible, there's never a time when you say, wow, what a compassionate spirit. What a heart for God. They don't do anything, but boy, they really feel it. Like you you see a commercial come on TV for some some great need, a great cause, and you say, wow, that's Teared up. I wonder what time the game starts. 
and your heart has moved on. Kindness is, demonstrates itself in action. Humility, that's just an attitude of self-evaluation that recognizes our sins, our weaknesses, our failures in a realistic way and also recognizes the power of God to work and act through us. It's, this is the kind of person God can use. This is a person that says, I really can't do that, but I don't have any doubt that God working in me, all things are possible. There's gentleness and gentleness, uh, meekness shows up in the fruit of the Spirit, shows up in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. It's a big deal in God's Word. It's obedient submission to God. It gives direction to our strength. That's the nature of our gentleness. Here's a power in our personalities brought under submission to God by the Holy Spirit. Patience, long-suffering. Uh, patience, long-suffering means, means that we endure under pressure, that we don't give up when life is hard because life will be hard. In this world, you'll have tribulation. We just take courage because he's overcome the world. So we... We keep moving, we keep going, we don't retaliate when we are wronged because we trust God to bring right. We are patient. Bearing with one another is one of my favorite little phrases. It just means putting up with other people. Any of you putting up, turn to the person next to you that you're having to put up with today and just say a couple of words to them about that. Don't, don't do that today if you don't... Save, save that for car talk later. We need to get you out of the building before that conversation begins. You're way too enthusiastic about that particular prompt. Let me, I need to stop and pray for you because your hearts are really hard today. Uh, yeah, Barry, have you noticed this about people? People are a mess. I'm a mess. You're a mess. We're all a mess. And there are things that you do. You, you don't give up on people who are messy. And you don't give up on ministry that's messy. And you don't ever give up hope that God takes broken things and makes all things new. Forgiving each other. Oh, man, forgiveness. Anytime we talk about forgiveness, it stirs up a lot of things in a lot of our hearts. And how do you forgive? Same way God forgave you. Oh, man. Well, that makes it hard. Forgiveness is to be reflected. Forgiving others the same way God forgave me. We look at other people and we say, well, you don't know how bad it was. God forgives you no matter how bad it was. You turn to him in repentance, he forgives. Well, I might have to forgive. I've forgiven them over and over and over again and I'm just done. Yeah, God's never done that with you, has he? Forgive for the same thing over and over and over again. We forgive others as God. They don't deserve it. Oh, we don't deserve God's forgiveness. Never do we deserve God's forgiveness. It's by grace. And we need to learn to be a grace-filled people. And then the most important moral quality to put on? Love. He says, on top of all others, put on love. And it hold, all those other things that we've listed, he said, this is just the belt that wraps it, makes the whole ensemble work. It ties it all together. It, it wraps up this wonderful stuff that God has made available to us. These characteristics. Love is the bond that holds the heavenly ensemble together. And it is a whole lot more than an accessory to our Christ-likeness. Third thing, we must let certain things in. Let certain things in. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We have peace with God, Romans 5.1 tells us. So we must let the peace of God fill and flood our being. Here's what the Bible says. Philippians 4, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's just, there, there's a harmony within, even when there's a discord and distraction without. The peace of Christ is the, is the umpire that regulates the unity of our relationships. Inside the body of Christ and those outside the body of Christ. Uh, I, I can hear you saying, because when I got to this point in my study of this passage, this is what I was asking. How in the world, all this stuff, how, how do you do this? This is more than a small assignment. How do you get all of this stuff check, checked off? Uh, hey, got that? Covered that? Growing there? Moving there? 
little progress there. How do, you, how do you roll with this? How do you develop these characteristics? Well, you can't do it by yourself. You need help, and God provides it. And so God's Word says here, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. Let God's Word take up residence in your life. Let it be a fixture of your daily life, your existence, and your heart will be filled with peace. The psalmist in the, the Psalm 119, which is all about God's Word, great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. So let the Word of God richly dwell within you, and just let it become a let, let, let the word of Christ set up housekeeping with you at home in your heart, that it becomes a daily habit. The presence of Christ in the believer, it governs your attitudes, it governs your actions, your thoughts, your words, your behavior. And he says, the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians, to take every thought captive to the obedience to Christ. God's word teaches us with wisdom, admonishes us, encourages us, puts a song in our heart and makes us thankful to God. Now, midst of all this, number four, we must let out certain things. The word, in, in verses 17 and 23, the word do occurs three times. When you have put off the old and taken up the new, there are character issues and attitude issues and behavioral issues. And here are three that he lists. He says, everything we do is to be done as service to the Lord. In verse 17, whatever. Uh, this is if you're preaching or if you're praying or if you're working or you're at school or you're in worship. Whatever you do. It's an act of service to God. We talk, we talk about this, that little phrase, whether you're a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. Whatever you do, it's for God. And we're to serve, thankfully. Not groaning, not complaining, but with thanks in all things. A thankful heart, thanks expressed, reflects Christ. There may be no characteristic that more reflects that a believer in Christ is different than everyone else than a thankful heart in all things. Give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. So, you have a thankful heart, and that's a way to tangibly express, there's something different about my life because of Christ in me, the, my hope of glory. We are to serve heartily. How can you serve any other way when you serve a God who gave His best for you, the cross? Verse 23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. And then finally, we must look up all the time. Just in case you weren't sure, you didn't have the focus right, here's the secret to the first four things we talked about. Our faith is in, our eyes are upon our Lord. The one the, to whom one day, Every one of us will give an account for all things eternal. We need to daily remind ourselves to whom we belong. I'm a member. I'm a member of the family of God, adopted into his family, an heir of the eternal. I belong to, I belong to his family, the church. And if you can keep that in mind, it'll correct a lot of thoughts and a lot of behaviors a lot of places where we lose track, lose focus. And I'm not going to read all of this passage, but I want to just point you this direction. This is a good place to start in applying this life of Christ, uh, this Christian life, this growing discipleship kind of life. Because the rest of this chapter talks about family. And if you want to do this, you want to practice this, why don't you go home today and practice this with your family? The people who know you best and I hope love you most, that you would seek to be these things and do these things at home. And he goes on, he talks about bond servants. Some of you, you, you feel like you're a slave at work, so maybe that applies to you really well. 
Some of you, uh, it says earthly masters, you think you're a master, but you're really not. But in that workplace environment, apply these things in the place where you are the most. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you have, you have home and you have, you have work or home and students have school. And then there's also usually a third place where you are a lot. And in that third place, apply those things in that third place of your life. And you'll find the, the we talk about turn your eyes upon Jesus. And it says, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We turn our eyes toward Jesus. And whatever 2017 holds, we spent December talking about this. He still has the whole world in his hands. And he has your world in his hands. And he loves you. Lean into 2017. Next week we'll talk about some key areas where I want us to lean in to what God has for us as a church family in this new year.